Hi, I'm Cody from Wall Street Breakdown. As we told you on Monday, things around here are going to change a little bit. As you can see, we've kind of reorganized the studio, painted things a little bit, and we've decided to bring you a bit of a different flavor in the way that the news is probably relevant to your portfolio. Now what I find with a lot of retail investors is that retail investors don't know their ass from a hole in the ground. That's just the way it is. It's unfortunate you get into a lot of conversations with people who feel a certain way about a certain topic because the news covers it a lot. We're still going to cover the news here at Wall Street Breakdown. I'm pretty heavily invested in what goes on in the financial markets. I'd like to know what's going on. I would imagine you guys would like to know that's going to be covered in the podcast. From now on, when we do these videos, we are going to cover topics that I want to talk about. I think maybe you guys need a little help in something that uh, maybe we all need a little bit of help in and getting a good dialogue going about something could help us all out in the long run. Ultimately, that's what we're trying to do here. That's the fact of the matter. The fact of the matter is they laugh at us. They laugh at all of us as retail investors. We're a bit of a joke. I mean, institutional investors would take the other side of our positions more times than not. I can assure you of that. Retail investors have a magnificent way of still trying to find the most difficult way they can to earn their money, and then the easiest time they can, justifiably, to lose their money. It's not, they're not going to the casino, right? They're not going to the casino, we understand that part, but they are still getting into the markets barely unknowledgeable about a lot of topics. I talk to a lot of people, they just don't know what they're talking about, or they don't have the robust knowledge set. They know one thing really, really well, and they can tout that rhetoric off constantly, just hit you with it nonstop, but that doesn't end up making them knowledgeable in a much more robust way. And the fact of the matter is, is when I say they laugh at us, institutional investors, Big institutional banks, pension funds, hedge funds, they know how to invest properly. We go out there and add liquidity to the market. We end up uh, giving money to a lot of uh, investment brokers, to a lot of financial advisors. We pay a lot of salaries. But anytime we're directly involved in our own investing, or worse yet, allowing other people to do investing for us and being passively involved, giving them the credit that they are the professional and ultimately we don't need to know is a fool's game. You're, you're being an idiot or I'm being an idiot. One of us is being an idiot. And the fact is, is that most retail investors, they lose. You can play a safe game for a long period of time, right? You're going to be able to do that. That's understandable. Playing a safe game is ultimately what we want over the long stretch. We're talking on a long time horizon, right? Because you're going to take into consideration what you earn, how, uh, how sustainable is that career, the amount of debt that you have outstanding, things that you're on the hook for, how many people in your household do you have that are a liability of yours? I say liability, they're a dependent. We'll use, we'll use uh, insurance terms. They're a dependent of yours. But the fact is, is when people cost money, they dig into the money that you bring home. What we're trying to do is find ways that you can take that little bit of money and have a long time horizon and be patient and be smart. But until they stop laughing at you, until you actually know how to invest properly, it doesn't make a difference if you find a cash windfall or if you find that little bit every month, not knowing how to do things properly is not going to be giving you any type of edges. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a breakdown of some things that I think are really important to just get knowledgeable about. So we'll cover all these topics again in later videos. We'll get in depth about all this kind of stuff. I hope to get into dialogues with a lot of you guys about as much of this as we can. So we'll break this down, but I'm gonna give you a nice general overlay of some things that I find very, very important when you're first becoming a retail investor. First steps, these are the first things that you're doing before you know anything, before you've gone to an advisor and you're checking his background, before you're making any kind of suggestions for purchases. Let's do this. This information is readily available on the internet already. There's a lot of opinions on the way you should do things. These are my opinions, the right opinions. Trust me, if you, want to, if you want to make money and not be laughed at like an institutional investor, like an investment bank, then you should probably invest like an investment bank. Just say it, right? Do exactly what the successful people out there are already doing. Have you ever heard of the 90-90-90 rule? Now, this is something that this, 
the, the numbers aren't perfect, you know? But the fact of the matter is, is the ideals behind the numbers are basically right on the money for what they're trying to teach you. So the 90-90-90 rule basically means that 90% of retail investors will lose 90% of their initial principal, the initial money they put in, their margin within 90 days of opening that account. 90% will lose 90% in 90 days. Is it real? Is that number 100% real? I can't tell you that it's real or not. I can't tell you that the there's statistics out there specifically showing this, but I can tell you that when you get when you get this type of talk from people on the big side of money, the investment banks, the, the, the brokerages, and they talk about this being real, and they talk about seeing a lot of clients, it's the turnover, the churn rate is high when you're talking about retail investors, especially guys working on their own platforms at home, the really busy platforms that got all the bells and whistles that basically are encouraging you to make transactions at all periods of time, right? The more transactions, the more you feel like you're, you're playing the game. And ultimately that's where they end up making their money. 90, 90, 90 rule means that for basically every one of us that's able to figure out the market on a retail level and how to actually go about investing, there's going to be nine of us that are sure that the game is rigged or consistently do this turnstile approach where they come every year, every two years with an account, four or five grand, whatever it was they built up and they blow that account up and we reset again. It's just not a good way to do business. You know, it's not a good way. It's not going to help you. You would be much more, much more helped if you spent the time research the things that are going to be the most beneficial to you, the things you're going to be able to put into practice and then went ahead and utilized those to branch off into what is a large body of work, of topics, of strategies. Let's face it, if you want to assume that the stock market isn't daunting, it's very daunting. But so is earning a paycheck for the next 35 or 40 years of your life. So is planning for your retirement 40 years on the horizon from now, right? Those things are daunting. You've got 40 years. You have time to learn this. It's a matter of investing the time in learning it, right? So... 90, 90, 90, I mean, just keep that in your mind. It's not because the, the opportunity isn't there. It's because that nine out of 10, a lot of the time, are choosing one strategy, one get rich quick when the line intersects the line here, that's the buy signal. That's just not the way investing works. If you wanna go ahead and do that, there's a lot of interchangeable face groups where new faces appear and talk about the amount of money that they made last week, day trading this or nonsense that, penny stock this. Cryptocurrency that, I mean, honestly, in this day and age, you could go on and on about the, the talking points of get rich quick nonsense, but they're the people whose accounts ultimately blow up or go away and you don't hear from them again and new crops of people come in and the hysteria stays high because enthusiasm is strong at the beginning, right? But it doesn't, it doesn't make for sustainable investing. So 90, 90, 90, let's remember that. Fundamentals against technicals, we just talked about a line intersecting a buy signal or sell signal, that stuff is, of course it's gonna happen in technical analysis, you're gonna get some of that. People tout technical analysis because it's much easier to do. It's much easier to do, right? All these platforms have it built into it, they've got the signals, all the, all the specific algorithms that say this is this sign and when this happens three times, this happens. And when you're try trying to correlate the past with the future and things on a graph, yes, are you gonna get some transactions that happen at certain telltale points on a chart? Yes, you are, because there's a bunch of quants, it's all set up and the algorithms just pop when they pop. So you're gonna get volume exchanges during these issues. But if you're not trading interday, which is not something anybody should be doing, you're not interested in this. These are not the signs, right? You do some technical analysis. When your fundamentals are done, you go and do all the technical analysis in regards to that company, that sector, its competitors, people it does, does business with, if it needs to hedge fuel, whatever, whatever it happens to be. There's a hundred million reasons why you might be doing some technicals on this, but you're doing the fundamentals first. And the fundamentals end up being 75 or 80% of things. Do not believe these people who tell you technical analysis is going to do anything for you. Technical analysis is all machine driven, computer driven algorithms. If you're trying to chase the money based on where charts intersected in the past as to where they're intersecting right now in this moment, you've lost the, uh, the point.
I wish I could help you, but you've lost a point. You don't understand that you don't understand how all the best investors in the world have made billions of dollars, not millions, invested in tens of companies that significant investments and made copious amounts of money. Right? If you talk about Warren Buffett, if you talk about uh, any of his cohorts, Charlie Munger, the way they invest over at uh, Berkshire Hathaway, I mean, you see the way a company properly does their due diligence on the fundamentals end. And if the fundamentals work out, and we'll talk about fundamentals in a much broader topic than this, so I can really explain to you what I feel fundamentals are. And they are basically what you've heard they are or what you could find out from them already. Like, you go look at a video, go read a book. The fundamentals are the fundamentals, but we'll get into them from the way that I perceive them. Just, you know, it, that way you guys can hear me tell you what I think, but it's not something that it's going to be a whole lot different. It's going to be a lot different than the way you get taught on the internet the majority of the time, which is that technical analysis is more important than fundamental analysis. You're going to find a lot of technical analysis information, things that are going to try to steer you over to technical analysis because it's a lot easier. There's all these signs, right? There's not a bunch of signs. The fact of the matter is, it's a good investor at an investment bank that they have an 18 month, 24 month horizon on things they're long on. They can see the future. They're, they're playing the future. They're not playing intersecting lines. They're playing the future and they're playing it based on the fundamentals of that company, its sector, the way everything that feeds into that company and its sector are all interrelated and where things are going on a global scale. It's, it's, it's very deep, but once you get used to doing it, it becomes the only way that you can actually analyze a company for what it's going to do if you're not planning on uh, really, really uh, short time frame positions, right? Not short positions, but a short time frame. So if we're talking about a portfolio where you're in something and you don't stay in overnight or whatever, you're not, this is not what we're talking about. I'm talking about being able to retire. I'm talking about investing over time and allowing compound interest to succeed for you. We're not having a conversation about the nonsense that is technical analysis versus fundamental analysis. That's not just going to be a conversation that we have here. That's, uh, that's for the birds, not for here. We're talking about the way things actually work and the way they work successfully for the people who invest the most money in the world. So why wouldn't they work for you? Unfortunately, there's a little more reading and a lot less uh, sell signal, buy signal charts. That's just the way things are. I'm going to teach you guys a few things that I think are prudent to have as an investor, a retail investor. You're going to need to have these. So this is going to be six. I've got them in uh, two separate categories, a practical behavior category and uh, a, a emotional response, a, a emotional behavior category. Um, so things you're going to need to know uh, practically is you're going to have to understand that the time value of money, of your money, is receding. It's receding hourly, every moment. If you don't have your money invested or put away in something under your mattress, in your savings account, it's not happening. Not even today is it acceptable. You need to be doing something and you need to be doing something right now because the time value of money is receding. Inflation ultimately crushes how much a dollar is worth today compared to how much a dollar, the same dollar, is worth in your hand next year at this very date. It doesn't matter what date this is. Inflation, 1.8% this year in the United States, something like that. It's not great. Inflation is normally higher than that. They actually shoot for higher inflation than that at the Federal Reserve. But inflation still is taking away the, the dollar value of the dollar that you hold at all times. You need to be doing something. You don't need to be taking a whole bunch of chances. If chances aren't for you, that's fine. You could be in short-term treasures. You, you could do so many. You could be in the one year, the three, something very, very easy. But you need to be doing something to stave off that eroding from the time value of money. I implore you that this is in a, in a practical manner. You need to understand the time value of money. It's a very simple concept. You need to understand why you need to be doing something with all liquid assets that you've got. If they're just sitting around, if you're just uh, if you're hoarding money under the mattress, I'm not too sure how many people still do this in this day and age, but I'm sure there's the occasional hoarder out there if it's under your mattress. You've got to be doing something with it. There's no two ways around that. We need to actually be uh, accounting for the time value of money at all points in times. MERs or uh, expense ratios, management expense ratios. If you're invested in anything through your RRSPs, through your 401ks, 
Uh, if you're it, invested just individually in funds, any kind of fund is going to have an expense ratio, mutual fund, everything. The more fancy the fund, the more managed the fund is, the more expensive that fund is going to be. That fund is going to take money off your principal, off the money that you have in there every year. If that fund is up 7%, maybe a down year, right? So the fund's up 7%, but the MER, because it's a heavily managed fund from some fancy mutual fund company, could be 3.5%. That's 7.5%. 7% becomes 3.5% when you take the 3.5 MER off. The expense ratio is vital to understanding how you can preserve your principal that you've got invested. Forget about down years. You're worried about people eroding money off their commissions or their management on the years that you're up because 7% becomes 3.5% very quickly with a very high expense ratio. And then on top of that, we talk about that first topic, the time value of money takes off another percent and a half, 2%. Man, with inflation and people taking their cut off the top, on a year that should be an average year, 7%, you're not really doing as well as you could be. I would suggest finding expense ratios, especially in your very early investing when you're not picking really specific funds, manage the specific way. You Maybe you, you like the fund manager, the style he does is managing. I mean, I'm, I would never be too tethered to any of this kind of stuff, but maybe that's your bag. You decide what you want to do. But I'm saying, look, you go find a low expense ratio index fund. You've got the S&P up almost 20% last year, NASDAQ 28, Dow Jones what, up 23, 24. You could be in, a, in an index fund that doesn't need to be managed, that you're gonna pay 0.75 out of Vanguard or something for. You know, you're gonna pay different even for index funds. I'm telling you that. If you go out there and look, you're gonna pay different prices on management expense ratios or expense ratios for in the same mirrored index fund, you need to know where you're buying your stuff from. Don't worry about the fancy, uh, the, the lettering on the letterhead. Who cares what company it's from? Care about your money. Care about your gains. They don't. They don't care about you. That's why, that's why they're laughing at you. That's why they laugh at you, for real. It's because they don't care. You're a mark for it. I, I'm a mark for it. People go out there and you want to be invested through BlackRock. You want to, you know, you want to see Goldman Sachs. You want to know that you're invested through these. It's the prestige of the bank name. For They're laughing at you. They're already making their money. They're making their money. Do you think Goldman's proprietary desk doesn't make money? Of course it does. It makes a lot of money. It makes money without you retail guys. It doesn't need you doing this. What you need to be doing is taking control of this yourself. This, that's gonna ultimately be the end game in all of this. You need to know how to hedge. If you're gonna have an account out there, you need to know how to long short these accounts. If you don't know how to buy an option, how to buy a, a, a put position on something because you're trying to hedge the upside and the downside, you are missing the boat on this entirely. This is prudent to knowing how to invest. You should be hedging a good majority of your investments. Look, if you're sure something in the next six months is going to go wherever it's going to go, it's going to go up, you love this position, you pay a premium to hedge to the downside. If you happen to be wrong despite doing all the fundamentals, not worrying about these technicals, doing the fundamentals, knowing what you're doing, and you're doing this on a recurring basis when you're picking stuff, but things go sideways because of unforeseen circumstances, because there's a million unforeseen circumstances that can take your positions down that have nothing to do with your specific position. I'm telling you that. Economic, uh, war, there could, a million different things could come in and be the crux that, that changes the way everybody takes the way that, that company's operating. You could, you could fall out of favor really quick. Things change. So let's say you've got a, a position, right? You think everything's going to ride. You're, you're good with it. Let's, let's put the position on good stuff. If you don't hedge that so that if that does take a turn backwards and you just got to, you just paid that premium, but you could get out of that price that you set the, the put at, you, you get a put that can maybe save you losing a thousand dollars compared to you holding onto a position you know you shouldn't hold on to and you hold it all the way down to something and lose $5,000, $3,000, whatever the, the principle was that you had on. Hopefully you're not out there playing with too much leverage or anything. If you're new and you're not, if you don't worry about leveraging anything, 
Don't get a margin call. Don't get your spot blown up. Just invest. Just invest with your money. Take it very light. Take it very slow. Learn these individual skills in a practical way out there doing it. And then on top of that, expect to find that you're going to you're going to end up having these pitfalls and take them as learning experiences, but take them as learning experiences with a small modicum of money that you do have allocated to each position, right? Like, so again, hedging. You're going to want to have a safety net against something for some reason not working out. An investment that you were sure was going to work doesn't work. So the difference is you don't make 3500 on the upside like you were going to make. You make 2500 because you paid a premium to the downside, but the downside protected you from potentially losing multiple thousands as opposed to the thousand you lose or whatever it is. It is it is the only way to play. Um, it, there is no way to hedge yourself in, in other, in other uh, gambling. It's gambling when it's one way. When you're like, let the horse ride, let it ride. I'm the man. I know what's up. You just let it do its thing. Yeah, then of course, you might as well you know, kiss your sweet ass goodbye. Things are going to change on you. Your money's going to go out the door. Because that thing is never going to ride the way you think it's going to ride. But you hedge your positions realizing that you're only going to be right occasionally and that moves on to the, the, the next the, the first behavioral pattern is figuring out that you're going to be wrong you are going to be wrong lots so the hedging is going to just help reinforce the fact that you know you're going to be wrong there's no crystal ball i'm going to get a crystal ball here and we're going to rub it and we're going to see if we can, can't predict the future but the fact that i've never been able to predict the future in the past i have let tons of good investment vehicles go because I was there, I seen it, I couldn't figure out how to make it work, and lo and behold, they, they you know, do crazy money. Crazy money, what are you gonna do? You're not gonna get them all. You gotta just resolve to the fact that you're going to be wrong. You're gonna be wrong. So get over yourself, get over your ego problem, get over whatever it is that brought you into this game to try to make you think that you could become a millionaire overnight or that this is easy, or that you're just gonna be right all the time. You're not, this is, you work out, go to the gym, go to the gym. The gym is a good proving ground for that because at the end of every set, if you take those sets to failure, those weights, no matter what size they were, no matter how much they weighed, they beat you. They beat you down. Then you've got to pick them back up again, only knowing again that you're going to fail. You may succeed for a very long period of time. You're going to dominate heavy into sets, but then at some point, failure comes knocking on your door and you need to pick your bitch ass up and get back to work again because that's the way it works. Failure is a part of it. That's just a part of it. So you're going to have to learn to understand that you're going to lose a lot of positions. So we go back to the hedging and hedging your positions is the only way that you can quell that trader's ego. Trust me, you start making money. You start doing things properly. You know you know what you're doing. You know everybody around you knows what you're doing because a lot of people don't delve into this. So unless you're doing this and you work at an investment bank or you work at insurance, you work with people that are heavily invested, actively invested, you are going to be one of a small group of people in your inner circle that do this. Even though every nickel and dime in the world, every everything is basically publicly traded money or was a bond at some point, a municipal bond, provincial bond, state bond, government bond, whatever it happened to be, almost everything was paid for through some type of investment or investment derivative. The money's out there. Not, not learning this is ridiculous. I mean, I'm just saying that. So you're gonna have to resolve to the fact that you're a loser. You're a loser. We're all losers. We're all making mistakes in this all the time. Not all the bets you put down are going to turn out to your advantage. But if you're doing the work, it's the work. Trust me. It comes down to the work. Uh, you're going to have to have patience. This is not something that's going to turn over in a short period of time. You're not going to become rich overnight. You didn't invent the yo-yo or anything, right? So get off your own nuts. You're not expected to become rich. Don't put that pressure on yourself. That's not going to do you any good. That's not going to help you make any kind of good investment decision. That's going to make you try to rush things. You're going to go out there and you're going to put a lot more risk on than you should knowingly. And you're going to chase positions and you're going to let positions get out of hand that shouldn't have got out of hand. And it's going to blow your spot up and compound it. A bunch of these little bad behaviors, a whole bunch of little ones are going to mess it all up. They're going to mess it all up. These behavior patterns are... They gotta be as strict as it comes. You literally have to be just stone-faced, stoic about this. Do not get attached to things. Realize you're gonna lose. Have the patience. Have a horizon. Understand the way compounding, the way compound interest works, the benefits of compound interest. Again, I mean, we shouldn't even be here if you don't understand how compound interest works. You should 
<laughs> if I'm gonna do a video on that, this might be a little above your heads, but compound interest, you understand, right? Allow it to do its job. Give yourself good behavior patterns. Give yourself these good behavior patterns. Find your way through this over the course of your next 20 years, your next 10 years. Come back to me in five years. Do this for five years. You know, you know damn well that you've wasted a couple hours a week every year for the last five years, for the last 10, 15 years. There was a video game, a TV show. There was some girl you were chasing. There was some something out there that you wasted time, wasted time. You could have been doing this. Do this for the next five years. Put that hour aside every night and do your homework. Follow good behavior patterns and come back to me in five years. Five years and tell me how that patience. I know people tell you, oh, goals. You got to set goals every month. People need to see quick results. It's the only way that they'll stick with it. Well, you can be broke. You can be broke. I don't care if you need to be glad handed through everything. If that's the way it's got to be, there's a reason that a lot of people fail at this. There's a reason why a lot of people end up broke at the end. It's because they need everybody to handhold them through this whole process. You're not going to get your hand held. Be patient. Understand that all these little bad habits from not being patient, chasing money, making bad speculative decisions, whatever it happens to be, not taking your money off the table, riding a loser even farther down than you should, whatever it is, nip these bad habits in the bud quick. Get that off the table. Get it out of your system. Understand that that's not the way traders trade. You want to be a successful retail trader, somebody that has a full-time job, but is able to, to retire two, three, four-fold better, than, his, uh, better than, the, than the people that he works with, better than the people that he knows, the people in his community. Not a big-timer thing, not whatever, just for your peace of mind. You work hard, right? You deserve what you deserve, correct? So I'm not telling you to just walk around flexing how great you are. I'm saying, put the patience in, put your head down, do the work. You know better. You know better than this. Get the patience. Get these bad habits out of the way. Out of the way and come see me in five years and tell me if the beauty of compound interest hasn't resolved a lot of your financial anxieties. And then tell me where you forecast yourself being in 15 or 20 years from then when you're ready to retire. And how much more aggressive you've become about the right practices when you deal with your investing. Tell me. Come and see me about it. Last but not least, we're going to wrap this up remembering that they've been laughing at you. They'll continue to laugh at a lot of your peer group that don't get their, their stuff together. They're going to continue to laugh, but they're not going to laugh at us. They can try, but they're not going to laugh at us because we're going to do the same thing that they're doing. We're going to do the same thing that they were taught by people who made lots of money, and that's trade like we're an actual investment bank. Trade intelligently, not trade impulsively. Trade off, trade off fundamentals, not trade off technicals, and not get emotionally attached to things. Develop good behaviors. This is not your income. Get yourself another job. Learn to pick up bottles. Take another shift at the glory hole, bud. This is not your income. When you make money off this, when the drip comes off the dividend, reinvested, that's where it stays. It stays in there. This is not your income. You're building this principle. You're building it. You're building the amount of money that you have to make your investments broader, to give you more reach into different markets, to give you the ability to do more with your money and to have compound interest, do even more with it. This is not your income. Don't make me repeat it. I don't want to have to come to the bank line when you go to take out your gains from last month and slap you upside the head, but I'm not adverse to doing it either. Just saying, because you know better than this. And you know, if the same 10 grand stays in your account forever, you're not going to make any progress or not the progress you should be making. And you know when you have a couple of down months, that 10 grand is going to go to five and you're still going to feel like you're obligated to take that extra thousand out. Because I guarantee you, a lot of people that start treating this as income, go and find themselves liabilities to allocate that money towards. Leave it alone. Leave it alone. This isn't your income to play with. You're earning this for the long run and allowing the gains to contribute to your compounding, right? Of course, right. Take another job somewhere. Honestly, 
Get yourself a flyer route. If you need extra money for smokes or whatever, go for a jog. We're not going to hold hands here at Wall Street Breakdown anymore. I get far too many questions about this kind of stuff. Actual technical analysis, fundamental analysis. Tell me how to do things properly. Okay, you want to know how I do things? I'm going to teach you how I got taught how to do things. I got taught by a fairly large, fairly large company. One of the biggest, might be biggest, brokerages out there. They taught me. They seem to see a lot in me as far as uh, the way that I would take on the information and uh, the responsibility they gave me to run with pretty much right off of Jump Street. So I, I don't like the, the whole brokerage setup personally because I think it, it infringes on the entire idea of retail investors. Even though they cater to retail investors, there's a lot of smiling because they're happy to take your money off the top. That's why. I have no interest in it. I don't care. I, I don't make a nickel off this. But I would much rather talk to you guys about this and jar a little bit some of the fans, some of the audience, and say that we can do a better job of this. Let's just focus on doing a better job of this. I'm Cody from Wall Street Breakdown. That's the story. The guys out in the investment world, they're laughing at you retail investors. They're laughing at me. They think we don't know how to do this. They think because we're regular people, that we're punks. Joke's on you, bro. A lot of us know what we're doing. We're going to continue to make sure that we uh, make this dialogue an open exchange and make sure that we're on top of our game and we're not listening to a bunch of the noise out there, a bunch of snake oil salesmen, a bunch of people that are talking down like you're never going to figure it out. You're going to figure it out just fine. I'm Cody from Wall Street Breakdown. Go ahead, like, subscribe, do all that kind of jazz. You know where it is. We don't expect you to do it. We'd like you to do it. We're going to come back with more content like this. Again, if you're looking for the videos where we're covering earnings calls and the news and all that, we're going to make the podcast on the weekends, on Sunday nights, much more in depth, probably closer to two hours. I am still, trust me, well, uh, well ingrained, I guess you could say, in the financial markets. I am following stuff tooth and nail all day. I love it, but when we're getting down to these videos from now on, I'm going to make sure we're talking about some topics. I'm going to make sure that we're covering a little bit of stuff that I think we need to cover that's prudent. And I've probably said that more than once now. So that's the end of that. How about you leave some comments and tell me what you think about things and give me some ideas. Let us know what you want to hear about or else I'm just going to keep coming back talking about whatever the hell I want to talk about. It's my channel. I guess I can do what I want 